Good morning, my neighbors! <laughs> Ladies and gents, it's Monday. And I think we should just try our best now to start the week on a positive note, on an optimistic note, following last week's craziness, last week's insanity, if indeed you want to term it insanity rather than the definition that I think that it meets, which is domestic sectarian terrorism. Anyway, I, I think we've all had enough of last week's insanity. Let's just try and start this one on the right foot, shall we? What's, what's the first news story? There's a global financial crash. That's right, guys. This is a story that the US economy is possibly heading for recession. Goldman Sachs now estimates that the chances of a US recession have gone from 15% to 25%. And this is off the back of jobs data that was published on Friday, where basically they were saying, look, we created 114,000 new jobs in this last period that we're reporting on, which sounds good, right? But that's down from like, I think it was 200,000 that they were predicting, that they were forecasting. So it looks like they, A, they've got it wrong. Like, can you trust their numbers? And B, you're not actually steaming ahead quite as much as you said you would be. And because, as the saying goes, when the US sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold, lots of global stocks are now tumbling as a result. So the US economy is sort of trundling along at a similar pace to that which they experienced directly after the pandemic, right? So that set jitters around over there. But also South Korea, their index went down by like 9% in 24 hours. That's huge. Japan suffered their biggest fall on their index that they've seen since their Black Monday in 1987. But don't worry, guys. Don't worry. I know sometimes we can be a little bit crestfallen on this channel. It is not all bad news, guys. Thanks to the tidal wave of global instability that we're all surfing on at the moment with Iran and Hezbollah threatening to bomb Israel, Putin and Ukraine, the possibility of China invading Taiwan, defence and arms manufacturers' stocks are absolutely flying. I'm serious. I know it sounds scary. I know it's all terrifying. But it's only bad if you, like, if you acknowledge, if you accept that World War Three is probably, definitely, on the nuclear horizon. If you accept that it's coming and that millions of people will die from nuclear warheads, right? That is only bad news if you're not selling nuclear warheads. <laughs> Next up to the sun, who go with day of shame. And it says riot thugs attack two migrant hotels. I mean, it's incredible, really, isn't it? It's absolutely unbelievable that even now, even after the violent racism that we've seen over the last few days, the sun are still calling asylum seekers migrants. Like all of these people are always assessed by the home office aren't they? They're decided like you can have a visa, you can't have a visa. And the overwhelming conclusion they always get to is that statistically, these people are found to be legitimate refugees, fleeing persecution, fleeing war and famine and oppression. But then they get mislabeled by people like Nigel Farage, Richard Tice, Rupert Murdoch as migrants of fighting age and invaders on the south coast. Then they get negative PR'd and billboarded as though they are staying in what, like a, a five-star resort with a free mobile phone and a little sunbed right next to the pool. And that gets everyone angry. They're like, oh, we can't take anymore. We're full. Britain is full. How come they get all this free stuff? But I get nothing, Gary. Until finally, there's a catalyst, isn't there? There's a spark in the tinderbox, an excuse to go rioting and looting and threatening murder of some of these people in these migrant hotels. And then what does the Sun do? How do they report it? Right there, it's the Sun, it's the People's Paper, and we're here to tell you that these are a completely detached, separated group of thugs from our normal readers that we market this exact kind of hate to. Like, I don't suppose it will shock any of you to learn that I rank my daughter's Princess Weekly and the Dandy above the sun when it comes to journalistic integrity. But the way that they have blasted out this hate and xenophobia and racism for years to literally these people, only to now, at this juncture, at ground zero, turn around and throw them all under the bus like, oh, look, look at this day of shame from these yobbos. I mean, that should tell you everything you need to know 
about these chancer, opportunistic, riot winger sociopaths. Like, just the way that they throw them under the bus. It is Donald Trump allowing the January the 6th rioters to go down for, like, five years. It is Tommy Robinson leaving in a taxi and letting all of his foot soldiers take the heat that time in Piccadilly Circus. It is Rupert Murdoch selling newspapers off the back of fear and paranoia and othering, only to see where this road inevitably ends. And to then be like, oh, didn't really realise it was going to... But this, uh, this, I mean, ours was just paper racism. Paper racism isn't real racism. I mean, look, look at these guys. They set fire to a hotel. That's, I mean, that is, that is different. Inarguably, that is different to our paper racism. Finally, to the Times, who lead with Keir Starmer's warning to, quote, rioters, as he says, you will regret this. Now, I think Keir Starmer was right to go on the TV and to give his address and to warn people and to appear prime ministerial, if that's even a word. I think that it's right that he gives some sort of speech and reaction and warning, right? But I am with Abby on TikTok. If you don't follow her on TikTok, then go and seek her out. I'm with her on the idea that, yes, some of these people are rioters. They're definitely not protesters. So let's move the terminology from here, right? You're not protesters. You're over here. You're right. Some of them are rioters, but some of them are terrorists. Like, if you're a Tommy Robinson, or a Ben Habib, or a Matt Goodwin, and you're on Twitter, or you're doing your own videos where you give your address, and you are saying, well, there's justifiable anger. You know, people have been angry and not listened to for, for a long time. It's justifiable. If you are lending your voice and support to people who are stood in front of a hotel, setting it on fire, and doing throat-cutting gestures at refugees looking outwards, if you're giving support to that, I say that meets the definition for terrorism. Because you have to ask yourself, what is this person trying to achieve? They are trying to justify or water down or dilute the seriousness of attempted murder. And if or when somebody ends up being killed as a result of this sort of stuff, it will be on an ideological bent, won't it? Because these are people who are, what, white supremacists, they're racists. They want to make Britain white again. It's down with immigration and multiculturalism. It is inarguably a political ideological lean, and they are trying to implement their political ideology by way of terror. So yeah, if I was Keir Starmer, I definitely would have done the address, but I would have used the T word way more. <laughs> I would have called these people what they are. They're not just far-right folks. That's in the right direction. They're not just racists, that's in the right direction. They are domestic sectarian terrorists, is what they are. And listen, just to leave you with this quickly, if people fleeing their country to stay in five-star resorts while everybody else pays for it, if that's the sort of thing that winds you up, who are you gonna be angry when you hear what Tommy Two Names is doing with that Patreon money? Speaking of Patreon, of course I have one. There's a link to it in the description below, and I cannot give you a 100% guarantee that I won't use that money to also flee the race riots. You can start the car.